Welcome everyone, welcome for coming out uh, this evening. Um, uh, agenda items, uh, can we first do the minutes? Um, are you happy for, they're, they're not signed are they? They're not signed, are they really happy with for their true and accurate account of uh, previous meetings? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everyone happy? No problem. Yes. Oh? Okay, thank you for, uh, thank you for producing that. Okay, well, do I date it as well? No. Uh, apologies, I have apologies for Nick Bunting and Sarah Peck, uh, members. Uh, is anyone else finding? That's it, okay. And everyone else is here. What about Scott Pritchard? We're missing Jason Pritchard. Sorry, Jason Pritchard. <laughs> 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 I've got mixed up between two people. Okay, all right. But hopefully he'll turn up at some stage. Uh, members' interest? Uh, any declarations before we begin the meeting? No? Everyone happy? Okay, thank you. And we'll go into our first item, item four, which is the certification of grants and returns. And I'll hand over to... Asim. 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 KPMG. Sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for having me. Maybe one last time. Oh, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. Like in terms of like, it's not because I'm sitting in Devonshire. Like if I'm being given the option to have one client in Northampton, I would happily go with Devonshire. So it's not like, and that's and that's mainly because of the healthy debate and the challenge that we always had from, I would not name the person, I would say from the finance team. And then, yeah, eventually every time we did manage to convince her, but it, it took some changing, so. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, in terms of the agenda item, uh, the how we benefit grants, so just to quickly run through the process and then we'll go through the letter. So as part of the Housing benefit grant from DWP. The council submit the initial claim in April, and then between April and November, basically we have to do our audit procedures, and then in November we have to submit the actual signed letter to the DWP. And the basis of that, the, the, the council would then get the grant for the next year. They like monthly allocated subsidy each each month for the next year. Uh, the, in terms of the actual work that we do, uh, in terms of all the expenditure cells where council submitted in the claim form, we select the sample, which we say the initial discovery testing, a sample of 20 initially, and then we go through that sample to see whether the individual claims are being done correctly by the council, by the assessor, and if we identify any issues with those 20 cases, what we have to do is to do an additional testing. So. Depending on the actual error which we have identified, either we can go with the 100% population testing within that cell, or if the population is bigger enough in that cell, what we do is a select a sample of additional 40 to then give us the assurance that whether that was an, uh, an isolated error or whether that is a trend within the claim form when they are assessing the actual benefits for the individuals. So in terms of this year, uh, you can see in the qualification letter we identified a couple of issues and then I would say like it's a kind of a same trend as compared to last year where the issues are being identified. So you can see on the initially the in rent allowance the way we are having the cases where people have the earned income that's where when the assessors are assessing those claims sometimes what they do is they haven't put the income correctly and that have an impact in terms of the actual amount of the claim that is being given to those individuals so in terms of the actual impact what we say is if there is an error it can have a in terms of the award of the subsidy, it can be a case where we have overpaid the benefits or where we have underpaid the benefits or where we, like there isn't any impact in terms of the actual benefits paid because of different reasons. Where there is underpayments and where there is no impact, basically we don't have to do any further work. But where there is an overpayment in terms of the cases, what we do, what we have to do is to extrapolate those errors based on the sample that we have selected, and then 
what we do is to quantify the amount to TWP that how much the impact will be in terms of the overall claim for the authority. So as you can see on, on page 9 of the report, yes. there is a table in there which basically says what was the added in the initial population and what is the added in the additional 40 plus testing and what is the total impact in terms of the actual claim form. And as you can see, it's just a minimum amount of 542 in terms of the grand scheme of the things. But it's just because we have to follow the guidance and we have to do that work to get to the conclusion to give the assurance to DWP that the claim is not materially misstated. So that was one of the errors. The other error that we identified this year is basically in terms of the, the cases where we have put the rent for the actual claimant. So where there is a rent for the assessment of that claim, so we identify some of the claims where the rent was not initially put correctly and that had an impact in terms of the overall calculation of the benefit paid. So then again, there is just a case where there, there wasn't an overpayment, it was just an underpayment, so we don't have to do any further extrapolation in terms of the claim itself. So those are the two errors that we have identified. One thing that I just want to mention that authority, because of the additional testing work that we have to do, authority agreed an extended deadline with the DWP in terms of submission of the claim form. So we submitted the claim form by 30, 21st of December as compared to 31st of November. So, but apart from that, I'm happy to take any questions on this. Okay. Is there anything you want to say before we take it to members? Uh, no, I mean, other than um, there are no tolerance levels with, with this particular claim. So you'll see in there that it was the £42.60 and in, and in the second area it was £2.68. Yeah. Now, we're talking about, you know, nearly £12 million worth of uh, benefits flowing through there. But that's, I just want to point out, KPMG are not being picky, but there, is, there are no tolerance levels when it comes to the DWP claim. Yeah. So, um, A, it shows that actually we're very, very, very good. Um, um, and um, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think then we'll get to that conclusion, possibly, um, with regard to, to what we think of that. Now, number one, you said was um, was was uh, was that an error by DDC on putting the wrong amount in and uh, salary in, and has that been rectified, or, or or is it just one of those things that happen? I suppose that's more for order, really, isn't it? Having identified the the the, the, the first error, the the, um, the five four two on, on the extrapolation of £42.60, um, you said that... That, that was is just salary. an earned income, like when they are assessing, like yeah. anyone who have any kind of source of income... Yeah. You said what, it's inputted wrong. Yeah, inputted wrong. OK, yeah. and would that be by DDC or by the... No, assessor, by the actual assessors who are assessing the claim form at that right. point in time. OK, yeah. that's good. Um, and the other, so, so we're aware of that. Was, was there anything we could do? I know it's small, but... Is it just one of those things or overall, is there anything that we've learned from that? In terms of whenever you're dealing with a volume service, and certainly where, you know, circumstances to do, can change, you know, multiple times, um, you can never rule out human error. No. Um, we certainly have a, a very robust training regime, you know, and that you, you can have new staff or things like that. So I'm satisfied that, and really the additional testing is to show, is it a one-off error or is there something, you know, systematic wrong with that? And this is showing that it, it is So can I add a little bit, because working with the team, what I know is what they're doing, like, since last year is in terms of any earned income cases because we have an independent person coming in the council Andy so Andy T Taylor so what is as a, as a team what they're doing is on a quarterly basis basically he's selecting a sample of the cases and then going through those cases to make sure that if there is any adjustments or any errors which they identify as part of his working it can be corrected in a year so then that don't have any impact at the year end. So that's why I know, working with the team, that this is being the change that they have implemented last year. Okay, good. Sorry, members. So, Richard, do you have anything? No, I do, Coach. Oh, thank you, sir.
And in no, you know, well, just which for the new boy, I'd like to ask uh, a couple of minor questions. <laughs> One, of course, you know, the amount of money we're talking about is hardly worth discussing, but uh, I'm interested to know, um, just because I'm new um, to this particular committee, uh, how, how um, we stand when it comes to overpayments and underpayments of these matters. Now, if we underpay, are we liable then to retract and pay or not? I didn't think we were. But if we if we overpay, we can get the money back. Is that also true? Yeah. So you know, um, it seems a little unfair, doesn't it? But, the, the but, but it depends. Like when we overpay, it basically depends on two things: either it's an early error or whether it's the claimant error. So you you have to kind of get to the bottom of that issue, like whether the local authority made an error while making the payments, or whether it's the individual provided the information which was incorrect, and that resulted in the overpayment. So it's not. Just just simply saying that overpaid or underpaid is basically then getting to the root cause analysis of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I used to love it when I was sitting in the equivalent board as chair of other places <laughs> dealing with these reports. It never used to amaze me that the, the DWP, an organisation renowned for its accuracy and precision, used to spend so much money chasing pennies. But anyway. Um, I wonder if I could ask a question about this, what am I looking at, page, page 8 of the bundle. Um, I fully understand that your sample size has to be adjusted based on prior year experience. Um, and in this particular case you have a sample size of 20 and then an additional 40. And you link the additional 40 to the fact that there were errors last year. Fine. But you also say given the nature of the population. Can you just explain what you mean by given the nature of the population? Because initially what I said is like the, what we can be able to do is if it's a small population, what we can do is a select a sample of 100% of population and then exactly know what is the value of the added and we can adjust the claim form. But with the rent allowance cases, because there are 4,000 cases I think in there, we can't actually do the 100% testing. So given the nature of the population, we have to select a sample of 40 to do the testing and do the extrapolation instead of being doing the adjustments in the claim form. Yeah, to, to the Chair, does that mean you should have said the size rather than the nature? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay. Does that... Yes, that's ask fine. Ask Richard. Uh, any, anyone else? Kevin. Okay. Just on the, uh, the box 009, that's the 1.688 million. Yes, we are. Oh, yeah. this one. Yeah. Is that the uh, Oh, yes, that was the thing. Anything else? I, I think that I heard correctly that if we overpay, we can claim back, but if we underpay, we, we, we don't have... Correct. But do, but do we have a, a, a moral, or are we going into a completely different area, a moral responsibility to pay people what they're due? I think we're going into it. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, I'll just... <laughs> I don't know if I can talk about that. That's, 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 that's got me buzzing now. Um, okay, right. Okay, nothing else. I, I do think it is important to note that the extrapolation, uh, if I'm reading this right, is £542 lost for £1.808 million uh, gathered in. Is that right? Or, or, or dealt with? Dealt with. Um, yeah. because, of, because of certain errors, and if you are below a certain amount, you're not actually penalised. Yeah. And that is way behold, below yeah. the threshold. So we, we don't suffer any sort of financial penalty for that. No. But I, but I think when you look at 1.8 million worth of business, yeah. to have an error of 542 on Xonex population is, is really good work. Yeah. And, 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 it's further complicated by depending on how the error occurred, depends on how much subsidy we get back. But that, that's a whole other sort of um, 
complex issue of how it's all calculated. Because based on the value of the error, what DWP normally do is they give you a margin of LA error, like local authority error, which within that is a kind of a tolerance level. If you if you have any under overpayment within that, they will have no impact on the overall claim. Okay, thank you, thank you. Just like one thing to like like for next year, basically in terms of housing benefit, the there is a change in the approach, like the central guidance which came through is an agreed upon procedure as compared to what we had this year as a report. So that there is a change in in terms of the reporting structure, but that's for my colleagues sitting here to worry about. But I just want to flag for you guys that there is a change in the approach for next year. Well, thank you. Very is, is, is this the only item you have with us? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, uh, can we as a committee please note the return? Are you all happy to do that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And a massive thank you to you. I'm sure uh, our, our, our officers have thanked you. <coughs> it certainly is uh, on behalf of the chair um, uh, and, and the committee. We'd like to thank you and your colleagues for, for the work you've done over the years with us. And you never know, we might end up working with you in the new unitary. If you get a vote, if we get voted in and you get the contract. Thank you. I would like to pass on thanks from Andy to everyone and especially to the officers who like literally helped us throughout these three years, four years. So thanks again and thanks for having me. And hopefully we'll cross over here sometime and be in sure awesome. so, Thank you. Okay, uh, it may be a good time. Just it's, uh, Neil Harris, is that right? That's sir? correct. That's it for me. Why? Just welcome, sir. Uh, your agenda just, items sorry, are here. So, uh, sorry, sorry Chair. I just need to um, let our auditor out, and I would like to be informed of this particular item. If you could just. Yeah, no, we will. We will. Oh, is it at the end? It's all right. It's at the end. No, no, we'll wait for you. Uh, uh, you're not doing it now anyway. Oh, I do. Like, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick doesn't have all yeah. these problems, does he? I think Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Harris, well, welcome, sir. Um, Thank you. And, and we will be involving you in item seven. Uh, that's two items away, so we look forward to hearing from you then. Okay, so, so enjoy. Um, okay, uh, number item two is the internal audit uh, progress report. And Scott, you're going to be um, yes. presenting that first. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chef. Um, this is the second um, internal audit progress report of the year, um, following on from the one in from the uh, September committee meeting. Um, the premise of this uh, report is to inform you of the significant changes or known impacts to the delivery of the audit plan uh, and any limitations in the audit resources. Um, it will include a summary of the progress uh, of our work up to the end of December. Um, it will also follow up on any outstanding um, significant issues from the 2017-18 uh, annual audit review, which was reported back in June, you, you may recall. Um, and then also, in addition, uh, on this progress report, I've also um, reviewed uh, the Council's internal audit charter, so that will be uh, something for you to digest, consider and approve. Okay, so if I start with the audit plan and our current progress, uh, I'm pleased to report we've got a full complement of staff, and that has been placed since the start of the financial year. Um, our IT audit provider, TIA, they have uh, been delivering to the agreed um, uh, program of work, which has been good. Uh, and I foresee no um, uh, issues that will affect our resources going towards the end of the financial year. At the end of December, um, we've completed uh, near on 60% of the audits, so progress is good. Um, the audit planning is on course for delivery, uh, and I have no doubts about that. Um, you may recall at the last meeting I reported um, a couple of changes to the plan. One of those was the cancellation of one audit, uh, the asset register, and the other one I reported was the um, addition of one audit, which was around uh, cemetery and market rents that we were uh, bringing back in-house, if you may recall from the AME contract. Um, details of the work are included in Appendix A, which is on page 35. Um, 
members would like to um, have a look at that. I'm happy to ask any questions about progress or otherwise on any of the audits that we've completed to date. That may be a good moment to pause if, if anybody has any questions, Chair. Uh, does anyone want to uh, pose any questions uh, with regard to um, Appendix A, page Appendix 35? <coughs> Uh, let, let them continue to we try. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure well. we may, yeah. uh, as the debate develops, that questions may stray into but just carry on with your okay. and then we can be stuck into questions. Okay, so if we move on to page 26 and the table at the sort of top of the page on, page, on that page 26. Members are familiar with this, or should be familiar with this table. It shows the level of assurance um, for the audits completed and then that, that comparison with year-on-year -year comparison. Um, but the full substantial limited mineral ratio is, 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 is uh, above target and is, is showing good, um, a good control environment is in place. And uh, also the agreed recommendations uh, there are, he are quite healthy percentages. Uh, and certainly from uh, showing a sort of gradual improvement on that was reported at the end of 1718. Uh, um, to date, uh, we have, um, as you can see, the table also we've got no um, finalised audits that have received a minimal assurance opinion, um, but we do have two audits of corporate significance uh, that have been completed that are worthy of bringing to the attention of this committee. The first of those was reported to the progress report in September, which was around uh, the general data protection regulations and the audit of that. Um, we uh, set out there, I don't in, in, uh, uh, intend going through that, but in set out there is the progress that's been made and the importance that's been given to that uh, uh, from senior management and service management. Um, we are due to come back in the next month uh, to undertake the formal follow-up of that, um, but as you may recall, um, the issue, the, in terms of issues, it was more around records management, but the actual delivery of uh, general data protection regulation was, was, was good. Okay. Um, there is, there is, has been one um, further um, area of corporate significance, um, and that is on corporate health and safety. You'll see it starts from the page, uh, bottom of page 27 and then goes over um, quite a bit. What I've included in there is why there is the level of detail there is to firstly sort of balance off um, how well the corporate health and safety um, is dealt with here uh, and put it and, and demonstrate there that the, um, the importance of some of the issues that around risk assessment that uh, delivered, but then hone in on the issue that I want to raise and bring to your attention. If um, you go down to two thirds way down page 28, you'll see a paragraph that starts off in respect of health and safety. It's, um, the importance of this um, uh, area is that it's linked to a corporate strategic um, measure. Um, the measure is the percentage of um, internal health and safety audit recommendations that are actioned in a timely manner. Um, this is part of the performance management framework and gets reported through the whole structure and all through to members through the portfolio holders and, and scrutiny improvement. Um, and certainly um, what the, that indicator was showing that, uh, to everyone that was, was 100% of recommendations that have been actioned in a timely manner. But in fact, uh, during the course of our work, this was being masked by um, the uh, non-completion of um, health and safety audits to the point of being considered by management and then action thereafter. Um, so that's one key significant area. Um, the other is then around um, the, um, outs the, the corporate measure itself. We started to look at the data that supported that and it was um, not taking consideration of outstanding um, recommendations that hadn't been completed from the previous financial year. Um, there was also, um, in our view, um, uh, a lack of um, oversee by the safety advisory group in respect of this particular measure. Um, we have been um, working quite closely with management um, on how we can improve and enhance the uh, monitoring that goes to um, that uh, meeting and they have a chance, uh, the safety advisory group has actually um, uh, considered the report now and has um, fully supported all the recommendations. Um, 
the final area was around the um, actual audit reporting protocol, which was lacked a bit of maturity, um, lacked a bit of definition, um, and certainly um, um, was missing of a particular critical area, which was around assessing the risk priority of the recommendations that were being made. Um, our overall, um, our um, recommended actions arising from the health and safety audits are, are not being promptly dealt with um, and effectively implemented. And there was certainly potential for significant events to occur if they may compromise, which may have compromised the health and safety environment. Um, and uh, this could also lead to damage to the council's reputation and hence you can see the importance that we've given it. And certainly management since the safety advisory group and the um, uh, audit report has been considered by um, uh, senior management team also at their meeting and has been given uh, the prominence, the prominence that, it, um, that it requires. And uh, management have also been working quite closely with us um, to um, uh, get to the point of um, uh, implementing the recommendations quite swiftly and we are due to come back and do a follow-up on that um, during the next month. Before we move on from yeah. that, from that uh, Deputy Chief, do you want, do you want to, because um, I, know, I know your comments there, do you want to add anything to that before yeah. we move on, because it's obviously a, a matter that you took quite an interest in. It was concerning. Yeah. At the end of the day, Scott Riley says the health and safety environment generally is good, but there's an audit of how we are facilitated that in large part, which was very concerning. And I, for one, and colleagues also are determined to have it rectified. Hence, the follow up is, and I'm grateful for the internal team to respond quickly to it when we when we're requesting a quick follow up. They will do a quick follow up, and I am confident you will see an improvement because it has been accepted, it needs to be improved, it can be improved, and it doesn't properly reflect actually the culture of the place. That's what irritates me in part. I say irritates, it does. Um, but the absolute need is to respond to it. In no way is it being challenged. That's what's fact. We deal with it. That's the way we've got always operated the audience. We deal with it. Because somebody has spotted something that we haven't spotted and it needs to be rectified. So that has been rammed home, we use the language which is not perhaps for the table, but it's been rammed home with colleagues and it will be addressed. I just want you to have that confidence that we're not very comfortable with that very coming. That, that's reassuring. Thank you. Uh, Scott, do you want to carry on? Or, or? Yeah, yeah. If the, no. Move on from that health and safety. That's yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I think it was important to get yeah. because that just emphasises the importance of how it's been taken by the organisation before members um, have a chance to uh, to debate it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, there was only one issue that was um, outstanding from the annual audit review for 1718, that was around business continuity management. I reported at the last meeting that a bit really good progress had been made on that, and that continues. Um, we are due to do a follow-up, and we've held back on that, um, given that um, uh, the, an IT disaster recovery testing was going to take place and has taken place during the past week, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, which also included um, elements of business continuity, and uh, uh, I stand officers went over to the off-site uh, off um, uh, facilities to um, uh, familiarise themselves with that. Um, so we'll be coming back to do a follow-up on that in February, but um, from my perspective, um, uh, management considered the, all the recommendations implemented, and uh, we've been closely monitoring that through the risk management group in any case. Um, the report uh, thereafter covers um, areas of work, and I don't intend to go through some of those which are around our IT work, counter fraud update, and then some of the work that we do around contracts and procurement. Um, and really, that really sort of pushes me then into the last item uh, on the list, which is around the internal the charter. Um, we're due to bound to um, review that and bring it back to committee for, for their consideration and approval. Um, you may recall a couple of years ago we had an external review of our internal audit service um, and we took the opportunity to um, um, update it prior to that and then also the review itself um, uh, adjust that against the standards um, and we w w wasn't requiring any, any changes to it. Um, since that time I've really just ta um, taken the opportunity to and you see as Marina has sent around the track change version of that um, is, is really just the only area that we have enhanced, which is around the standard on um, um, the internal manager having responsibility for any other areas. And I've, I've mentioned in the um, in previous reports and within the internal charter was the responsibility I have for corporate fraud. It was just really bolstering that um, element up, uh, which is um, you'll see on the bottom of page 48 of 49. 
damage. Nothing else really other than minor changes uh, were required uh, throughout the job titles and the like. And then it just acknowledges at the end the external review that's uh, uh, taken place and when the next one is due, they're, they're, they're due once every five years. But obviously then we've got the different landscape coming forward as we uh, go towards Unitree. Unitree, so that's <laughs> <laughs> So that concludes, uh, Chair, that concludes my um, uh, progress report and I'm open to it, uh, answer any questions. Good, thank you. Um, I should really open up to members first because I, 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 I sort of get excited really and I can't con contain my enthusiasm. But so, so members, is there any questions please? Richard. Thank you. Um, I read this report, or particularly the part of it that relates to health and safety, considerable concern. Um, I am somewhat encouraged by Simon's comments, um, which have helped, and I think we need to get some further report in due course just to satisfy ourselves that everything is now correct. Um, health and safety isn't the sort of thing you can mess around with. I mean, on one level, it is about action plans and registers and ticking boxes at a superficial level. But on another level, it's about the safety and security of the council systems and buildings. And on a further level, it's about people. I mean, for example, if you have a building with air conditioning and you don't maintain the heating and plumbing, you have a risk of Legionnaire's disease, and people can be killed. So you've got a risk to the people, but also you've then got flowing on from that a risk of prosecution, not just the council, but of any culpable individuals within it. Um, I am greatly encouraged that you've said what you've said. Had you not said that, I'm frankly going to be highly alarmed. One little bit of wording in this, though, that says we aren't quite there yet, is on page 28, the final sentence of the second paragraph, which is talking about the risk registers. It says, management should be reminded of the need to review their service health and safety risk registers. I don't think reminding management is the outcome you need. Management doing something is the outcome that you need. Simply reminding them doesn't deliver. So it's not really a question as such, it's a comment, but uh, I, I think we need to ensure as a, as a council and as a committee that we ensure that this has been dealt with fully and appropriately in due course. So would you like to respond to that? Well, I'm glad you have the same view because <laughs> that is an organisational point. Members and officers have the same concerns because it does come back, back to people at the end of the day, potentially. So it was pleasing to note the fire risk assessment work. Yes, that's been duly notified. That's a people focused element. My concern was about making sure that our teams were able to facilitate by having A, the understanding and B, the right processes and systems in place so that we could have confidence as an organisation we're doing the right thing. Because it was a surprise to me. So the important point for me out of all of that is promise. Because this, you don't let health and safety just go on, you know, we'll improve it in due course. No, we need to improve it now. I think genuinely, and I think Scott will have the understanding from management colleagues, this can be rectified quickly. So I, I don't want you to be too alarmed in the sense that there's something that's fatally flawed in our organisation. It's not that. It's a case of I wanted assurance, I've got it, that things are doing, we've done the right way. But let's prove it now, because it does not feel right to me. But why, but my God, I was irritated, and colleagues were irritated, because it's not, it's not how we should do it. Sorry, thank you, Leslie. Uh, ask a question for Deputy Chief and say, is there a time line that you've got for, for sorting this out and getting the training light? Are we talking weeks, months? So the follow-up is next month, by which time. Some things are already in place, mm -hmm. being rectified since the report. Conversations are ongoing. Yeah. So by the time of our next meeting, yes. you, should, you, you will feel comfortable that everything is being put Assuming the outcome is what I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> and that's for Scott and Collins. But okay. Scott can give a view on whether he feels confident. So I can also follow up with that. Yes, certainly, Richard, and then I'll come to you, Ian. In the cup, Scott ordinarily would do a follow up to each audit. Yeah. Given the severity of what's been found here, when would you schedule a follow up for this? Uh, next month. Okay. I mean, we're, we've started it already now, in the formal process. Um, with you to then undertake a formal follow up at the point we know um, recommendations have been implemented. And, we're, and they're near enough there already. Uh, they've turned it around quite swiftly, uh, with our help as well, because obviously it's a, um, it's a similar process. You know, it does duty of our own process that can be relayed in, you know, a, a later 
the top of that. So, um, you know, I, I have um, confidence that um, they can do things pretty. And, and the report maybe might not say too much in there is, is a lot of the work was actually done by the officer that reviewed the, the audits. It was just not getting to the point of formalising that, that work, getting it through um, their first own internal management structure to then get it out to management for their, um, their prompt action. Um, but the work was being done, and I have no doubts that even if, if there were um, significantly high priority issues within there, um, that they would have been raised outside of the audit process, which that is something they've put into their um, uh, reporting protocol now. Uh, the importance really for me, though, is that, uh, as um, uh, one of the members has already said, is around the fact that, you know, you might have medium or, or low priority considered recommendations, but you know we're talking about health and safety. It's, 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 it's completely different to an internal audit recommendation. Health and safety can can potentially affect lives in terms of the, um, the significant impact that it can have if that comes to um, if that arises. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Let's ask a question, yeah. Richard. Ian. Yeah, there's a, this chair is more of an anecdotal comment than a question. For me, health and safety is only at one level, and that's people. Um, now, I was going to, and I'm absolutely sure that this doesn't apply to this organisation in any way, but um, health and safety is one of those strange areas where one is asked as an organisation to criticise oneself, and uh, <clears throat> which can have legal implications, of course. And I just want to give you a little bit of an anecdote here. I'm familiar with a, a small builder. Now, the building industry is notorious for its um, poor health and safety record. Um, but this particular builder has, quite frankly, the best possible health and safety record that you could imagine. And the reason for that is, I wonder if you can guess. Well, I'll tell you. He never reports anything. It's as simple as that. And uh, so, I know this could possibly, uh, you know, uh, be, be laid upon this authority, but it's just one of those strange things that, uh, that I feel that um, uh, we're asked to basically criticise ourselves. We're well, going to have to do that, but what about the legal implications of doing so? That's, that's, that's the, you know, my, my sort of way of thought. But what about the legal implications of recording uh, you know, for instance, um, an accident. If there was an accident, yeah. then there is the prospect of... Well, so the, we'll call it an incident, not an accident. But yeah. the, the legal implications of carrying out an audit and uh, carrying out your own self-critique, yeah. yeah. there's no particular implications per se, yeah. until an accident perhaps happened. Yeah, and then you recall... And then it would be used as evidence. Yeah, against you. Potentially yeah. is the risk, but we're not at minimal. You know, if that was middle, gosh, you know, then we have got a problem. Mm. We're limited, that's still problematic. Mm. But I'm more interested in whether we can recover or if there's something in there. There's a, <coughs> it seems to be recoverable quickly and a lot of it is kind of system based as opposed to the, the approach, the culture, the intent, the projects that go on is we're not doing those things wrong. So mm. things that are probably affecting the people's staff are being done, but not being facilitated quick enough through the prompt push through to management and then carry on through to senior management as, as Scott was illustrating. So there's improvement that can be done but it's not, I was initially thinking when I got this, have I got people in place who are not able to do this work to actually facilitate what we need to have? I'm assured and I'm confident we do have. We have demonstrated it very well so let's demonstrate it. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Um, Scott, just a couple of quick questions. On page 30, the TIA, it says that they've not actually completed in the IT audit. No. But you'd mentioned several minutes ago that they were on schedule. Are you happy that they are going to do something in the next two and a half months? And B, <laughs> it says uh, it's likely to have an extension of at least one year. I guess that is subject to what happens. Yeah, I'll cover. Shall I cover? Could you cover yeah, if you just. Yeah, the first of those is, you know, to put into context, um, TIA, we bring them in, the specialist um, skills that they have, 
Um, the 30 days audit um, is, is about three audits uh, in effect, um, covering substantive areas. Um, they have started and uh, almost completed two of those audits. Um, there was some slight delay over the December, January, um, beginning of January period um, from some resourcing issues that they've had. They're completing that work and there's just one more audit to start. And so I'm confident with um, having spoken to the director there that they will complete the, um, the, rip, um, the work by the end of the year. Um, the other element is that the contract is in place until the end of March. We had built in as part of that procurement exercise that uh, there was a possible extension for two years, so we could keep them on, that um, we will be having negotiations with them to discuss uh, potentially um, having um, an extra year added on, which was in the context of the unitaries and would fit, fit that. That's, that's the, the thought. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yes, yeah, I've got to, you're almost worried that your question will get asked, don't you? Because <laughs> there's, there's, there's a decision to make. I, th I think um, I'm really pleased with um, the, the narratives I've heard with regard to health and safety. You know, at the moment, um, we have the Hillsborough trials going on, and, uh, you know, an ex colleague and uh, a member of staff are being prosecuted. And, and we all know the consequences of when we get it badly wrong. And that all starts right on the small things if we if we do not take health and safety seriously if we don't really grip it up at the very early stages then we are on our way to problems and 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 and, and, the, and the possibility that the loss of, of of innocent lives so i'm really encouraged to uh, chief, chief except with with your uh, intervention and your comments here and the general attitude that we're going to grip things up at a really early stage mm -hmm. uh, really uh, making sure we're doing everything right ticking not only ticking every box but actually getting the right culture that this this is important this isn't just about being pink and fluffy this is about a serious area of business and making sure people are safe so so thanks so thank you for that um the question i have and um, I've, I've tried to work this out uh, is with regard to the completion of the high priorities we have a target of 90 percent we're currently at 88 percent which is better than last year and i do know that some of the things take time to get done and we're in the middle of the process and some are coming up in february are, are we i don't know whether this is to you sir or whether it's to you scott is are we happy that that we're where we should be with regard to getting uh, priority recommendations done following audits or is there because if you look through it's, it was only in the in 2016-17 we were 100 percent i would have thought we want every year to be 100 percent on priorities is there something systemic about the way we do business in this area or are we quite happy that we're at the best possible completion rate that we can be at any particular point I mean, that's one of the points I um, put as a qualifying fact in, in terms of the, the low number of, given the, um, how we've improved, helped management to improve the internal control of the environment over time, um, we've got to the stage where there are um, so few um, high priority recommendations. So to have one or two of them um, not be implemented at a point in time can, can really skew the figures quite, quite a lot uh, in terms of percentage. Um, we come back, we work uh, quite closely with management in any case through the risk management group, the IT steering group. Um, management get, regularly get um, both um, on the back of the appendix, you, um, the, the detail in, in terms of the monitoring of that. Um, we, if we wish, if we if we were concerned about a high priority recommendation, so much so, we would then escalate it up to SMT and the chief executive. But we haven't had the course to do that. So there are very it is um, it is very few um, uh, recommendations that, that that cause that to um, to dip below the target uh, and. On occasions we have got, as you've seen in 16, 17, got it at 200%, but as I say, one or two can really have a detrimental effect on that. Yeah. And it doesn't really probably tell you the truth of the picture. Hence, really, then I've tried to then um, uh, provide you also then with the uh, percentage of all agreed recommendations implemented to cover the whole. Yeah, but, but I don't think so it's all part yeah. of that barometer, really. Yeah, so with the, I think um, that's the point of the question. The question isn't about where 
that we're at 88% is that is are we because of course one or two may skip depending on how many you have but are we where we should be and and and, and if we just have 10 and we're at, and we're at 88% is that where we should be in other words the culture is is to grip these high priorities to to scrutinize to monitor them to to be relentless with regard to their completion is that culture present if it is then 88% is exactly where we should be if it was 65% that's where we should be because the culture is great is that is that um, yeah, it may be a question. question for management types, but, it, but what I would say is, um, you know, I, and I've said this before in conclusions to some of the reports, we have to be quite careful with um, the, as we head towards that unitary, uh, and the the mindsets moving away of thinking about unitary and not, and, 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 sort of, and wanting to sort of concentrate on business as usual here. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I don't get the feeling that ha that's having an impact just yet, but that's just something to okay. be, a, be aware of as an insightful as we, as we, move, as we move forward with them. Yeah, I, I don't think the risk would necessarily be to the high re priority recommendations, it might be to others, because right. there is a resource issue with neutralisation, no okay. doubt about that. Okay. But the bottom line is, I'm, I'm a perfectionist by nature, so 100% you might think it's the right thing to do, but I'm also realistic that actually you can never get that, because uh, something, will, can. something will happen <laughs> during the year, so that's always a risk anyway. So we, whilst we put those figures in, overall, that seems to be a good level because it does reflect a culture of giving priority to this kind of work of improvement, of trying to learn and improve mm -hmm. and respond, not just to resist and then fight. Mm -hmm. We actually try and take it on board and develop. We're pretty good at doing that as an organisation. Thank you. Sorry, you No, I accept what uh, the Deputy Chief Exec says on that. However, since I was introduced to zero defect policy, and I'm sure we've all heard of that, um, there is, it is not possible to have a target of, of 90%. The only target you can ever have in anything is 100 percent i know it's not i know it's not possible i know it isn't i know it's not realistic but it's the only target you can have do you understand what i'm talking about where you come from yeah. there's a whole discipline about performance management and smart indicators and all the rest of it yeah. so you know, they are smart it's realistic realistic so <laughs> it's a bit difficult that one the culture is what you're after. Yeah, the culture is what's The culture, I would suggest, is what Scott, I think, would be telling you as a committee if the culture was not right, if the management response was not appropriate. He would be telling you, because he's unfettered in that. I think you've got quite a good picture there. But I will end with perfection and try and pick up the look. <laughs> that's my nature. I don't think that's what's the great thing, is, is that we do have trust and confidence in, in Scott and his team, in the senior management team, that you do bring up difficult subjects and subjects and areas that you're failing with, and that's important. Mm -hmm. That transparency and that honesty, and then that grit to sort it out. So, um, unless there are any further questions, uh, what I'd like the committee to do is to resolve that one, the committee acknowledges the progress towards achievement to the audit plan, two, that the committee endorses management's response to those aspects of the internal control environment highlighted within the report, and three, the, that the internal audit charter as attached to Appendix B be approved. We're happy to resolve that. No, you yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, risk management, I think that's next. And then uh, the other time. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Your colleagues will turn, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be clever then. Completely, completely You're still right, Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's another time, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Um, what you've got before you is the annual risk management progress report um, and um, it's important to, to understand that um, this committee has a role in uh, reviewing the effectiveness of risk management as part of the um, council's internal controls. Um, clearly um, we've, we've heard a key part of the internal controls is, is the internal audit progress report and we've just um, received that report and that had some help, help you debate on, on that. Um, the intention of this report is to supplement the, the process by providing an update on risk management over the past year. So in, in section four, it sort of breaks down the you know, sort of key areas of work of, of um, risk uh, management. Uh, 4.1 talks about the um, strategic risk register. And I'm sure members will recall that um, they saw a um, 
revised um, strategic risk register at their September meeting, um, which was something that uh, members here had called for, as well as um, management and uh, members elsewhere, um, was a mid-year review of the strategic risk register, particularly taking account of the um, uh, potential uh, local government um, uh, reform. Uh, so that drove a review mid-year. Uh, what we're looking at now is the, the, the annual review of the strategic risk register, which builds on, on the changes that were uh, agreed by Council in October and um, takes the uh, um, strategic risk register forward. Um, there is a, a copy of the register. Um, I apologise, the tendency seems to go out of order, um, but we're looking at the um, uh, page 65, um, which shows the working pro progress from this register um, uh, as it flows through, through the system. Now, it's not the role of this committee to approve the strategic risk register. Um, that's done by council, um, and the, um, the strategic risk register will be going to portfolio holders meeting uh, tomorrow, goes on to strategy group um, early in February, and then on to February council. Uh, it's merely there as evidence of, of um, as that review uh, taking place. Uh, <coughs> moving on then to um, 4.2, um, member training. Um, a member training session was held um, in November. Um, which was fairly well attended um, and ran through um, our, our risk uh, management process um, and we had good feedback from, from those members who uh, attended. Um, what I haven't captured in the report but I'll just mention here under, under training is that there is a, a training session for managers which is um, will take place I believe on the 7th of February, so sometime early in February uh, and again that, that's about um, the um, uh, um, providing the right skill sets for, for management in, in driving risk management forward. 4.3 talks about the role of portfolio holders. Um, uh, portfolio holders at their quarterly meetings receive updates um, on uh, uh, risk uh, management issues um, and are now regularly receiving a, um, a report on priority project risks um, which helps them understand where we are and also um, they receive um, updates on strategic risks um, through management portfolio holder liaison meetings. Uh, service risk, risk uh, registers which sit beneath the um, strategic risk register, um, these have been reviewed currently as part of the um, budget service uh, planning process um, uh, taking place for, um, to put some up-to-date plans in place for uh, the coming financial year. Um, the service risk registers, information risk logs and fraud risk logs are monitored by management uh, and any emerging or uh, emerging significant risks are referred to the risk management working group. As Scott mentioned, the risk uh, management working group in reference to monitoring the um, uh, audit um, reports and, and the delivery of the actions contained there. Um, the risk management group receives um, um, reports um, from, uh, uh, by exception from managers, in respect of any risks that are causing concern at service level. So those are fed through to that group and as part of the uh, assessment of risk we, we've got this top-up approach of issues arising at service level and um, uh, uh, top-down um, looking at uh, some more strategic uh, risks uh, arising. Um, Moving on then to the Risk Management Health uh, Check Action Plan, a committee will recall um, that the, um, a health check was undertaken um, about 18 months ago now, um, or quite 18 months, but September 17, um, which um, provided us with a, um, a positive um, assessment of our risk management um, uh, processes. Um, but did come forward with some um, uh, suggestions for enhancements to the um, our, our, our work. Um, we've really been overtaken by events in, in, in that respect. The, the, the challenges were particularly around developing an assurance mapping uh, process 
uh, as an enhancement to, to our, our risk management systems. Uh, but in the light of um, the um, potential unitary uh, councils, um, I think um, we heard from Simon earlier about the, the workload for um, uh, officers and, and, and for members in, in getting uh, ourselves ready for that, we felt it was something that we didn't um, uh, want to take on at this particular point in time. Uh, the other elements of the, the um, action plan have um, uh, largely been delivered and there's a copy of the action plan uh, at page 61. Um, in conclusion, um, uh, we believe that uh, good progress continues to be made in, in managing the Council's strategic and service risks and therefore the um, committee are invited um, to resolve that the risk management processes, progress is noted and the current approach is endorsed. So I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. I wonder if you would um, referee this. So if we start straying into anything other than just making sure it's happening, mm -hmm. you can call us offside. Yeah. Uh, and although the debate may be interesting, it's uh, it's not within our remit. So um, so we've got a ref in place. So who would like to start? Do you have a yellow and red card? I uh, would hope he's brought them along. If not, we'll uh, we'll have that to the business. Yeah. 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 Put it on the risk register. <laughs> anything from the? Oh, no. yeah, fine, fine. Okay, well, we anticipate a mass average aggravation. Would you like your question to be generated? Just yeah, yeah, go on, go on, do last one. If you get a yellow card for this, that is you're in big trouble, you know. <laughs> Consider putting in place a formal governance process for tracking and closing of actions within strategic and service risk registers. Recommendation R8 Basically saying that's a way of saying, checking that we're actually doing what we said we're going to do. I think, and that was for implementation last April. I'm not trying to follow the logic of we can't do that because of local government reform. It's surely not a great technical thing to plan with. Well, it, this was about enhancing um, our, our existing systems. It's about um, making some changes to, to the templates. But we, we believe, and, and it was shown in, within the um, the assessment, health check assessment report, that um, we have good systems in place. Uh, I said, but this was one of the uh, enhancements that was um, proposed. Sorry, I failed to generate a card. <laughs> Try better <that> next time. <laughs> No, it's a good question, as always, sir, as always. Yeah, I, th I think I understand that, that, uh, that is the fact that uh, we, what we're currently doing is good and acceptable and workable mm -hmm. and achieving the outcomes that we want. Um, what Zurich was saying was that uh, there was possibilities of enhancing or making it a little bit more sophisticated. And at the end of the day, we've got bigger things to worry about and limited stuff, so, so we need to concentrate on that. And I, I think that's a, good, that's a good approach. Had we been failing, in the first place, I think we would want yep. those uh, those things to be implemented. Good. Okay. Okay. Committee. The uh, we then resolve that the risk management progress is noted and the current approach is endorsed. Are we happy with that? Yes. Thank you very much. Right. That completes the meeting. Oh, yes, it is a joke. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Thank you. I'll tell you, we'd be really upset if we all walked out. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, welcome Neil and welcome to your company. Thank you. Um, uh, we're looking forward to working with you, uh, perhaps for just a year. Uh, you never know what happens with you. You never know. You never know. Yeah. So, never know. so, uh, so uh, we're in your good hands, sir. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair, and good evening, uh, members. First of all, just a bit of introduction. I'm, I'm Neil Harris. I'm an associate partner in the EY's Government and Public Sector Assurance Team, and I'm based in our Luton office, and I lead the team of our volunteers that work, uh, that work in Government and Public Sector out of our Luton office. Uh, EY will also be the auditors from 1819 for all of the Northamptonshire local government bodies, and I think that's an important context when I delve into, into the audit plan. But also help, I hope, helps for you as members and generally across Northamptonshire ensure there's going to be a consistent approach in a period of a lot of uncertainty and change across across the county, but also one point of view from EY on those significant decisions and judgments that can be made across the county and then we'll have implications on each of the districts and in terms of my role I'm going to be the lead audit partner not just here at Daventry but at all the, the districts and boroughs with the exception of Northampton Borough Council and Northamptonshire County Council uh, where one of my partner colleagues Steve Clark will be the lead audit partner on the County Council and the borough 
we've we've got a, a way of working already in the firm where there's a, a network between Steve Clark and myself where we're in touch regularly to share what's happening across the across the county and that I'm cognizant of any things that happen at the county council that may impact on the districts and how I respond during the course of the audit. An example of which I'll come on to in, in the audit plan. I think the most important thing that I want to get across about my style is one of no surprises. I want to build not just for the officers here but with you as a committee uh, an open and transparent approach and one where if I've got any particular concerns either here or just generally across the county I want to make you officers and this committee aware at an early stage but equally be held to account on our service delivery as a firm given it's our first year and we want to make sure that we build we make a positive impression on you as a council but my approach is also if we have any particular difficulties ourselves as a firm I want to be again very open about that with the officers and, and here with this committee so that's my approach and what I've applied elsewhere and, and that's just hopefully by way of an overview um, also just about transition to because a change of order always brings that element of uncertainty and and I suppose concern about our approach or uh, see we're, we're still following professional auditing standards the same accounting standards apply so uh, the methodologies that KPMG would have used EY broadly follow the same ones um, in terms of our approach to technology and how we deliver our audit very very similar approaches we would have reviewed KPMG MG's files and um, we've considered their reports from last year and all that's helped to inform our initial view of the risks that are going to drive our audit this year. So that transition has largely been completed anyway and whether there are any slight tweaks in what you might do it will be important that we have ongoing discussions with particularly order and finance team about well, where does it look different and um, one of the things I can say right at the very beginning is that here at Daventry you've been one of the most proactive councils across Northamptonshire and reaching out to the external audit and say when you're coming in here's our view and when we'd like our interim and our year-end visit and by the way we want to tell you all how we do things here um, we're about proactive close down um, you, you start off on a very strong footing and I think we've used that to reflect about our own timings I think it's fair to say from some questions and challenges we've already had so I, I like that dialogue and I'd like that to continue. So that's sort of an opening gambit for me before I head into the plan. I don't know if there are any questions just to begin with on the transition to EY before I delve into our planning document. Anything from members? No. Anything what's add to that order before we move on? Okay. Thanks. Right, thanks. Okay, so the audit planning report then is our assessment of audit risks that drive our audit of the council's financial statements for the financial year on the 31st of March 19, but also under the National Audit Officer's Code of Audit Practice, where we think we need to perform our work on the value for money conclusion as well. Um, this is an initial assessment, and that's based on the work that we've undertaken to date in our planning activities, review of corporate strategic documents. We are coming in in a couple of weeks' time to do an interim visit which is walkthroughs of key financial systems, as much early accounts testing that we can do. So I, I, I do want to put some caveats to say this is an initial planning report. Perhaps if we've been your auditor for a couple of years it might feel a bit more definitive. So it, this might feel a bit iterative for the first year we might have been your auditor. Um, and also the timing of the document as well reflects some events that we were aware of at that point in time where actually in discussions with officers and across the county things have moved on as well. I'll, I'll walk you through. So this is our initial assessment. Uh, the key section to draw, your, to draw to your attention is page 75 of your papers, which is the overview of, of our audit strategy. And it, this page focuses largely on the audit of the financial statements. So there's two areas that we have to consider by professional auditing standards as a rule of thumb on every external audit in KPMG would have had the same rules, which is the first is to consider the risk of management override. Um, so where do we think there might be a risk of management override and, a, 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 and incentives to change the financial position at the year end? And then the second area is the risk of fraud in revenue recognition, which is about understanding the council's key income and expenditure streams and transactions during the course of the year. So we start off by saying that we can rebut the risk of fraud in revenue recognition, which is where KPMG, I think, also said last year, understanding your key income and expenditure streams we don't believe there's a, any significant material risk of fraud in revenue recognition and actually comforting to to uh, hear and see where
where internal audits are at at that as well, because that always gives us a good insight. The area then on management override, um, there's a slight change in how we've reported management override this year, and it's probably come out of quality reviews that we've had done on our files by the Financial Reporting Council, so it might look a little bit different to what you might see from KPMG before. But in responding to the risk of management override, there's, there's mandatory audit procedures that we undertake on every public sector audit. The first is to review journals, significant journals in year and at year end. Estimations, significant estimates that are made by management at the year end, so that particularly we look at provisions. Um, and then unusual transactions, are those out, out of the normal course of business, we would also look at, and that's driven by auditing standards. What the risk of management override also asks auditors to do is, do we think risk of management override could manifest itself in any other area of the accounts? And if we think it does, we need to pull that out separately and report that specifically to you in the audit plan. So that's why we've got uh, a number of areas we've identified here that we'll focus on. Um, the first one on the incorrect capitalisation of revenue expenditure, we tend to have in most local government audit plans. If we think there's a, a risk of uh, benefiting the financial position of a local authority, either now or in the medium term, the likelihood of that would be through the incorrect capitalisation of revenue expenditure. We would test that by looking at the council's capital programme and significant capital additions in year to make sure they've been capitalised appropriately, uh, and that will be the focus of our work. The next, um, the next two areas, I think it's fair to say, are in every local, in every district audit plan in Northamptonshire. So this isn't specific to your circumstances at Devontree. It's a judgment that I've taken about the environment that you're facing within the county at the moment and where I think being a skeptical auditor, I want to just pay a little bit more attention to. So if I look at the County Council's stabilisation plan and what's, um, what the County Council's uh, requests and dialogue is with the district councils, not only is it on the collection fund surplus, which I'm going to come on to, but it does, uh, it does ask and beg questions of what the level of provisions are in each of the district councils. Now, I know all I know Audrey will tell me that the council will be extremely prudent and appropriate in the level of provisions that are set here at Daventry, and I don't doubt that at all. But as a sceptical auditor and just thinking about where the risks might be in the financial statements, that's probably an area where we'll just do a little bit of extra testing at the year end on the provisions, and that's why we've reflected it in that way. It's not to say that this council's doing something you shouldn't be doing, it's just a, a sceptical auditor. Um, so that's the, 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 the focus on provisions, and what we mean by provisions, it would be the business rate uh, appeals provision, the bad debt provisions in particular. Um, the accounting for collection fund surplus is probably one that has moved on, so this was written at, at a point in time when there were proposals across the county to vary the timing and the nature of payments of the, of the collection fund surplus. And I, I, I do want to give Audra a huge amount of credit on this because there's been two CFOs, I think, across Northamptonshire that have been coordinating the district's response to those proposals and particularly holding EY to account about what we're doing to look at this consistently across the county and, and Audra's one of those. Um, the most important thing that I've tried to represent in this is that the County Council have had a <coughs> proposal and had a request for the districts, but actually it's the district councils that would be enacting that and would have to follow the prevailing regulations. So from my perspective, whilst I know there's a lot of focus on what the County Council are doing, actually, actually more important for me is the district councils making sure they discharge their, their fiduciary duty and apply the regulations appropriately. And not only that, what are the accounting implications as well? Um, so we, some of these events have actually been quite fast moving this, uh, just before Christmas and just after, but there was a proposal we involved our uh, some legal and account, we got some legal and accounting advice, and I think to, to, to just try and summarise where I think we ended up, we had some concerns on legality, we thought the regulations were very prescriptive about what can and can't be done to, uh, on the timing of the release of surpluses. 
Uh, but then, but then, in addition to that, and I think what what has drawn this to a halt is the accounting, because the accounting position is very much, I think we've reached a view, a cash flow position. It does, she does not, would, would not change the accounting position either at the county council or within the district councils for um, this financial year 1819. I think because of those two factors, the county council, I think with the districts, have reached the conclusion that this proposal is now no longer going to happen now. Mm. Actually, I think to some extent they've run out of time because it was, if it was anything was going to happen, it would need it to happen before the 15th of, of January. But nonetheless, this event has come to a close. The reason why it's in this plan is because at the time I drafted it, it was a significant proposal and actually I we needed to give it proper attention across the EY because if any of the districts said yes we are going to do this but actually we had some concerns that, there, that this could be um, outside of the regulations there are statutory powers that immediately come into play as an external auditor so I'm, I'm actually pleased we're in a position where we're certainly in very much in agreement with the district councils and how they've gone about this and I think the county council have paused their request at this stage but I think for, you know, every, every all of the local government bodies in Northamptonshire have been heavily involved in this. But you know, I think it is fair to say Daventry have been the most proactive in not just holding the EY to account of what we're doing on a timely basis and sharing information at the right points in time and there's some learning on that from our side, uh, but equally a very clear point of view about what can and can't be done as well. So I think just to give you some assurance as members that this council in particular has been very clear on its position. So just some clarity, I don't want to interfere, I want to give a presentation, yes. but is that now public knowledge that that's, that column in the stabilisation plan is no longer achievable? Is it public or is still? As district and boroughs, we've certainly met with the commissioners right. um, uh, and they are aware that um, we will not be doing that. How they um, communicated that to their members, so I can't comment on. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Yeah, okay. Some some such all hatters, yeah. and, I, and I wasn't aware that that had been. I was at a budgetary meeting recently, and right. I wasn't aware okay. it was um, it had been off the table. Yeah. But um, but I will be discreet. And and, and just being, I'm just following the logic of why I'm a sceptical auditor on some of these things is that clearly, as part of the stabilisation plan, there may well be other measures that the county council might then request out for the district councils look into, yeah, which, yeah, is why I, yeah, yeah. which is why I mentioned provisions. We did as a team consider whether the movement in reserve, the movement in reserves might be an area we might look at. So if you contrast what's in this plan with what you might see in other audit plans across Northamptonshire, we do refer to the movement in reserve statement as being a significant area we'll look at, given your current financial position and where we think the incentives might be. I'm not clear, I'm not convinced that's a significant risk here at Devon Tree. So that's why we're just focusing in particular on provisions. Um, group financial statements, I, th uh, I think it's fair to say that, the, that in terms of accuracy the council do intend to prepare group financial statements this year, so from the perspective of the external auditor we'll just want to ensure that that consolidation process has happened appropriately and there are no, um, there's no risk of, of any material error and then I think it's just understanding the nature of the component and the scoping of our group audit. Uh, that can either be a, what we describe in the firm as a full scope audit where we um, ask further work of the component auditor or we make it a very specific scope so if there are any particular balances in the subsidiary accounts that we're particularly interested in, we focus on those. So that's the bit I think I need to come back to this committee on um, either before we finish our audit or when you receive my audit results report and say actually this is how we scope the group audit. At the time we wrote this, um, we were questioning why it wasn't consolidated last year. I think it's been very clear, the officers have made it clear that they're going to consolidate and prepare group accounts this year. <coughs> um, the next two, the valuation of land and buildings and the net pension liability, no change from 
the assessment made by KPMG. So uh, these are areas which will always be subject to a higher inherent risk as an external auditor, significant judgments, estimates, reliance on management aspects, but a number of this range of assumptions that go into both the valuation of assets and the net pension liability. I suppose the, at this stage the reason why these are not significant risks is we need to think whether there are any other special circumstances that might elevate that. So in the terms of valuations, I'm not aware of there being any significant change in the use of assets, any significant impairments, or any significant change in the valuer or change in methodology. So that so I think that's why it stays as an inherent risk. And likewise on the net pension liability, it would be things like large-scale outsourcing, changes in membership composition that may skew the results and why you'd elevate that. Again, I'm not aware of any of those circumstances here, so what we'd be doing is very consistent with what we do on, on all local government audits, and particularly on the net pension liability, we'll be um, having a programme I work with the Northamptonshire Pension Fund, which is also audited by EY. I'll turn you to page 76 then, which sets out our uh, level of, our planned level of audit materiality. So I'm just wondering, Committee, I don't know whether it'd be good to take that page yes. as you move on to, uh, I don't know whether it would, if you would like to do that or wait until the end. Would you like to take this page on um, with any questions before we move on? How do you feel? If you want to take the page, uh, yeah, should we take, should we, as, as you fine. move through, we'll take yeah. the page on. So, any questions with regard to um, the, the audit strategy, page 75? I think so. Yes, Richard. Um, can you just explain what you mean by fraud risk in the context of incorrect capitalisation and revenue expenditure? I think, uh, I think that's just a, a, a way we term it under the auditing standards. What we're describing here is the risk of management override and the way we think there might be an incentive to uh, give the council some financial benefit, not just now, but in its medium term. Basically, yeah. I mean deliberate misrepresentation yeah. rather than yeah. misjudgments. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because it's quite a motive language, isn't it? <laughs> It when is. you first read it, you it think, is. And it, it, what's yeah. been going on? Yeah. The, the way, you, the way uh, you're, you're driven by auditing standards and the way yeah. you have to write some of these things, so I absolutely agree. Uh, and I always try and preface, preface everything I say by saying, it's not because we think the council are doing this, this is just areas where we apply professional auditor scepticism. I, th I think the narrative is being informative and yeah. reassuring, and, and you know, it was just... I was just surprised with the language, yeah, rather than yeah. I didn't think there was anything wrong with this council. I think it's a, I think it's a useful challenge because as yeah. with, all, with auditors, which you try and make your reports as clear and open and transparent as possible. Yeah. Certainly the FRC are very keen, external auditors expand a lot more on their audit reports about what we mean by certain phrases yeah. and think the more we can do. Yeah. Yeah, but your, your narrative was, was, was very informative and reassuring. Sorry, Kevin, please. Yeah, just, just look here. On the significant risk on the financial statements, if we did the group accounts in 1617 or group accounts in 1718, why are we going to do them in 1819? I think, Kim, um, from our perspective, you always have to assess whether or not there's a, a, a component that's significant, both from a materiality perspective, so quantitatively is a subsidiary material, but also you have to look at qualitative factors as well, so if the council has a significant influence in a subsidiary and can vary the, the benefits and decision making of that subsidiary, then that's also significant. I think our judgment is based on our knowledge and understanding of the subsidiary's transactions, we think that's material and therefore should be consolidated. Now, always, this is always the thing with a new auditor, you, an auditor can, a new auditor can come in and have, a, have a, a, perhaps a different point of view, I'm not saying KPMG didn't think, thought differently last year, but I think it's fair to say officers have already taken that judgment, this might be a bit of a timing issue with our report, we had some questions, but officers have already thought through the answer themselves to say, actually we intend to consolidate as well this year, so we've probably come at it together with the same answer, but it probably hasn't been reflected as well as I would have liked in the summary. Yeah. 
Sorry, yes, I just just to add to that, obviously in terms of uh, uh, we're, we're getting used to a new auditor as well, but certainly um, in 16, 17 and 17, 18, we went through very comprehensively with KPMG as to whether group crack accounts were appropriate and because of the circumstances around and in particular it was TDECL at the time, um, one of the significant factors is that, um, that there was a plan to dispose of them and that actually plays into whether you need to do the group accounts and KPMG agreed with us that we didn't. Now 1819 is different because A that decision has been overturned and equally we now have Daventry Norse um, that we'll have to do group accounts for. So you have to think about the benefit to the reader and because we're going to be doing group accounts anyway and because those circumstances have changed. So I, I must admit when I first read this audit report I thought it portrayed that you know you didn't do them in 16, 17 and 17, 18 but you're going to do them now so that meant you were wrong in those years. That's entirely not the case. It was perfectly right for us not to do group accounts in that and that was agreed with our auditors and it's perfectly right to be doing them in 18, 19. So is there anyone else's hand up? Um, just with regard to this particular strategy, already the landscape has changed, you know, from, from your own testimony we've just heard that um, things have changed and things may not have as much uh, relevance. Uh, is, is it organic uh, it, it, uh, or is it set in stone, these strategies? In other words, you've set your priorities here. Yeah. Um, are they set in stone or, or it, as the landscape, and it is going to move quite because of Brexit, because of Unitary, um, does it move with 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 changing circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think I said at the beginning this is an initial audit plan. Okay, so we've got an interim visit coming up that will test our understanding yeah. and that might actually um, reinforce where we might have significant risks. It may take some hours. Um, the provisions one is a, is a good example. At the moment we're elevating that because of the environment environment surrounding you at the moment in Northamptonshire but again when we go in to do the interim visit and look at the judgments that we made it towards year end of those provisions we may take a view that actually that can just come down again so this is our initial plan and I do think it's organic um, the other thing that's very important is we have to look at your draft financial statements and that in itself can change there may be items in the account so give me a different lens than what I've got right now and uh, it's important that when I come that through this committee I explain to you here's where we are now this is what's moved and then this is where I've where I've ended up before the end of July Good. yeah so so presumably if the structure changes Tony then we will be informed through this committee is that, is that how it works as uh, and then you'll be presenting the yeah. any alterations to that's right yeah. okay. okay thank you so okay um, so on page six sets out our <coughs> initial view on materiality. So we've set for a plan level of materiality of 796,000, which is on page 76 of your page. 76, thank you. Um, 796,000 represents 2% of your audited gross expenditure for 17-18. When we receive the audited accounts, we'll revisit that number. So in EY, I think KPMG have their own methodology for setting materiality. In EY, we use a percentage point range between 0.5% and 2%. We've gone for the higher end of the range because that we, we look at your overall financial environment and the stability of the council, whether there's been any significant structural changes either in your Daventry, what your public profile is at the moment as a council. And I think taking all those factors into account gets us to set materiality at the higher end of the range. In other councils, um, we may have factors that mean we have to set materiality at the lower end of the range. So materiality is always something that you keep under review throughout the course of the audit. Um, one that I think we will be feel a bit more organic is what's called tolerable error which is set at 50%. A tolerable error guides the level of work we need to do on the income and expenditure account, the uh, balance sheet, the movement and reserve statement and the cash flow statement. And we've set, in EY we have a, an approach where if we've taken on the first year audit we set that uh, level at 50%, so we have a choice between 50% or 75%. <coughs> 
what gets you to 75% is having a really strong control environment, few, a history of very little or not, not that significant or pervasive errors in the accounts on, in the prior year. So I think this is one that will be organic because I know from reviewing KPMG's report last year, you've got a good clean bill of health from the audit and you are very effective at the close down of the financial statements. What's stopping us getting to 75% is our own testing of that and I think the interim work that we do on the walkthroughs of the systems early testing, that reinforces that position, then I think I've got the means to revisit that tolerable error work that range for the, for the year-end accounts and I may increase it to 75%. Uh, which does impact on the level of audit differences and what I report to this committee was that based on the current figures I'd be reporting any uncorrected differences above 40,000 so I think that that number may, that number may change on year end. Okay. Anything for that page? Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, so that's the overview. I think um, the rest of the plan starts to feel a little bit repetitive, so I won't go through the ABC no, 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 page just, by page. But on page 77, just very brief, because Tony Poynton isn't, um, isn't here this evening, but a really important person on the audit, because Tony will be the audit manager and the, the key face-to-face -face contact here with the finance team and the person responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the audit, and making sure we hit our project milestones. Um, but are encouraged by, I think, the dialogue that's been taking place between Tony, Audra, and the finance team, and, and ultimately, I have responsibility for the opinion, but I think it's important that that, that relationship from the day-to-day -day audit manager with the team here works effectively, and uh, this is our first year, and I'm very keen to get feedback from the council on how that goes and keep, keep my audit team structure always up to review, but Tony's a very experienced local government auditor, um, very good technically, and uh, has a lot of experience at district council, so I'm sure you'll be well served by Tony, and I will introduce you to him again. So the only other area I really wanted to draw out because the section two starts to get, which is 79, and one starts to go through a little bit more detail how we're going to respond to the significant risks. So I don't propose to go through that section. Are there, just, are there any questions with regard to skipping through those? Anything particularly you wanted to bring up? No? Okay. So we'll carry on with your... Uh, so that, I think the next key one is 1886, um, which is value for money. So the, the risk, so the, we're following National Audit Office guidance here, and the risk here from an external audit point of view is giving the wrong conclusion and saying that the council's arrangements for value for money uh, are, not, are, are not appropriate. Um, and, uh, so how do, we, how do we form our risk assessment on value for money? So we look at your corporate documents, we look at your financial plans, we look at the risk register, we consider the work of your internal auditors, we also uh, consider KPMG's prior year findings. Now at this stage we've not identified any significant audit risks on the value for money conclusion, so I think that reflects well on what we found from our initial planning activities. You'll see from the narrative on page 86 that there are areas that we will be considering as we uh, as we can undertake the rest of our audit. And I think the main area that we do as a standard on every local government audit is do some stress testing of your 1920 budget and your medium term financial plan. And we've got tools within EY, I'm sure KPMG would have had a similar thing, which just stress tests and puts just put some stress tests on uncertain income streams, the level of reserves and balances, the savings target in the medium term and how achievable that is. And that draws out our own view on, on the risks to your financial resilience. Now from my own understanding of what I've seen today, I think you're in a very strong position relative to others I've seen. I'm not saying that you've got challenges and your risk register pulls that out, but relative to others that I see, I don't see a significant risk for this particular financial year and your financial resilience. But I think it's important we re review that with the final budget position for 1920 and the medium term plan. Um, clearly cognizant of what's happening across the rest of Northamptonshire and as just has just been mentioned, the, the, the draw on officer time and capacity and the resilience of this council for business as usual. I think from an external audit point of view, that's a watching brief for us. We just, you know, as part of our ongoing audit, we'll see whether that creates any strain here at the council and we'll, we'll report that to you if we have any concerns. I suppose the only other thing we would look at in for value for money is any other key 
these strategic governance decisions that the council makes between now and the 31st of March. And if there are any significant decisions we want to make sure the council's gone about appropriate due di uh, got that in an appropriate way and exercise good due diligence. Um, we, we tend to find in other local authorities quite a significant commercial activity, and that drives in quite a lot of work from the external auditor about making sure the council's sought appropriate professional advice, using experts appropriately, and considered all of its options and reaching the right decision. So I think it's just we're still building up our knowledge of, of you, but based on what we know today, we don't have any significant um, concerns or risks associated with the value for money conclusion. But to reassure you, we will be doing the work that we think we need to do to um, to, to verify that for the event. Okay. Anything on that page? Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. So, um, I have a couple of other points I want to leave uh, you with, because I think Section 4 and Section 5 and Section 6 take you of, of repetitive. So the next key page is 97. It just gives you a schematic showing the timeline and communication and deliverables that you expect from, uh, from us. And you'll see uh, the, the next key milestone, I think, of the external audit is coming up in the next couple of weeks, which is our interim audit and our walkthroughs. And I think it's really important in this first year that we get as much done as we can at this stage, because it puts us in a really good shape for the year-end audit. Uh, I know the council are ready for us, and I think we've let me our end of the bargain now in a couple of weeks' time and go and get as far as we can. And I've had conversations with order. I know Tony has as well about what areas can we focus on in February. And I know the council are particularly keen to look at valuation of assets and the methodology that the council's used this year and I would agree with that. Key judgments that the council's taking as much as we can look at now the better. Um, so that's a key that's a key area. I wouldn't necessarily report back to this committee on the outcome of that work unless I had any concerns. So usually as external audit we report by exception if we had any concerns from our entry work. But I I'll go back to what I said earlier, this is an organic process this year, so if anything changes, we'll go through the process. And then it's the year-end um, audit, and uh, I think we did have a very successful year last year on fast close. We want to ensure that that happens again this year, and um, uh, we've got clear expectations on all of our local government audits learned from the first year about what we expect to see. The councils uh, themselves would have their view as well about what they expect to see from an audit firm too. I think the most important thing is us all working collaboratively to hit our milestones and and um, coming to this committee in good time before the end of July. So I don't have any concerns about that at this stage, but this, hopefully this schematic helps you see what you're beginning to need why this year. Page 99 and 100 are uh, my confirmation that we are independent and objective. It's something that I keep under review throughout the audit. For example, page 100, it's worth it's worth saying that we have been asked by Duxley Street to be the reporting accountant on the housing benefit and certification of the housing benefits and subsidy claim for 18-19. And because that's under a different contracting arrangement now and a, and a different guidance from the DWP, that now that does now constitute as non-audit services, whereas in the past KPMG would have considered that to be part of the PSAA uh, arrangement. Because it's now not audit, I have to make sure I confirm back to you that I don't believe there's any issues from us from an independence point of view undertaking that work. And we have to make sure that the fees that we're setting are within a, a reasonable threshold and within our ethical standards, and they are. That's what we're confirming back. I do have a question on, on, on this this section. It's um, you know, You're coming in with fresh eyes, and yes. I, I can see so many benefits for fresh eyes. I really can. You know, we had a good relationship with, with KPMG, um, but, but, but someone new coming in. Uh, are, are there any downsides to fresh eyes? Um, or, or, or am I looking at it in, in the right sort of way? This is when it comes down to ensuring that, at the end of the day, this is public money, isn't it? Yeah. And this is this is as elected members. That's what we worry about. You know, we know historically we've got a good team, but are there any downsides to fresh eyes that you see with regard to your, uh, your relationship with us? I, um, I think I'll, I'll just start the positives. I would certainly agree 
us a benefit from having fresh eyes. What we need to get back to the officers in this committee and across Northamptonshire is clear insights about what we think as well and being consistent across the, across the board because that's when you'll get the maximum value out of EY being the auditor across all of Northamptonshire. I think the key downside is given your strong position from last year, we don't over things, we don't right. over audit, we don't nitpick too much, and we actually reflect the the environment that you've got and and whilst you'd expect as an auditor it's about checks and balances and making sure if an officer's saying something to you that can be supported by evidence but actually if it is and those assertions are there just because we're a new auditor this year don't you know there's the, you can have a risk of overdoing it as well and that's why we review kpmg's files from last year we review their reports we have the discussions with management so there's something about proportionality from a new auditor yeah, yeah. And I'll be challenged on that as well. I mean, you know, this this will feel different this first year, and I think it's important that we have the open dialogue. That at key points, Alder can pick up the phone to me, and there's already there's already been a couple of good examples of that already. But to say, actually, Neil, this is happening. Um, why are you doing this in this way? And just have that that challenge and that dialogue. So, yeah. Good. I was surprised KPMG didn't bubble her up before, but. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just uh, so finally we're into the appendices. So main one, appendix A, fees, page 104 uh, <coughs> sets out the the fees. So the PSAA set the scale fee, and the scale fee is 37,564, and our estimate of the non-audit work is 4,500. Uh, where there are where we believe there's any changes in scope, it's really important that we have an early discussion with the officers to say why we think the scope of the audit is different to the scale fee where we think our, we need to start to take additional audit procedures and why. Um, before we come to this committee, we need to have reached a view with the officers on that, and then but ultimately PSAA approve any variations to the audit fee. So we just put a note in here to say areas where we think might influence that, but I think as your lead audit partner, and having a, had experience of a number of discussions on fee variations at a number of local government bodies, the most important thing I want to get across is that that's just it's not slam dunk. I'm not saying we were automatically going to be charging additional fees. I think it's back to proportionality here is having a, a reasonable discussion where we think that might be triggered and having that early. Uh, presumably, we as a committee, if, if say, say an additional fee comes in, we, we would we would scrutinise that and look for justification. Or is that is that decision made outside of our remit and and agreed with the the, the, the public sector audience appointments? So I think I think PSAA would expect. I haven't gone through this process a number of times, but I have to pro I have to provide quite a lot of granularity to PSAA to support any variations. So it gets down into the skill mix you've used, what testing, additional testing, mm -hmm. why that was over and above, and how did that reflect the risks? And then the challenge that PSAA particularly ask of us in the rigour of their testing is, have you reported it to the audit committee? And what was the audit committee's right. view on that? So okay. yes, absolutely. So if I was seeking additional fee for the first foremost is through the officers, but I need to account myself to the committee to say your comments. It's the public yeah. money being spent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. So any other questions with regard to that? Yeah, just, just for me, I'm not sure I've got it right. You say that the total fee 37,564, yeah. final fee 48,784, is the difference what what could be? No, so I think 48,784 was the final fee of, for last year from KPMG, 1718. Right, okay. Yeah, and I think the difference for 37,564 this year is the benefit that you've got from the new contracting arrangements for the next five years of PSEA. So PSEA will be able to... Pardon? <laughs> yeah, the PSEA will be able to bake it up further. About 20% reduction in your in, in the scale fee. So for the same service that cost us 48, 17, 18, we're getting that service for 37. <coughs> okay. Benefits of competitive procurement for you, Mr. Chairman. As long as the work skills. Hmm. Well, I think it will be. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Okay, so it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Okay. The audit professions coming in for a lot of external 
reviews at the moment, and that's not just on the public sector side, it's <coughs> competitions and markets authorities, a Kingman review, um, and actually only thing I will say this committee, and it might be worth myself and all of bringing it back to future meetings, but there is one section in the Kingman report that talks about local audit and the view of the work that public sector auditors do in one page, but it, it's in the context of the wide, wide scale responsive failures at Carillion and BHS and others, but there, there is one page that refers to public sector audit and the regime and fees and quality, so that is probably worth bringing back. It is, because I'll tell you what, a million questions are just sparks in my head about the difference and, and the reasons behind that are probably not appropriate for here, but, but it would be maybe interesting to get some understanding, I don't know how the committee feels about that, but in an appropriate settings where we could ask candid questions and as to um, I think it why might the difference in fees. Yeah, I think there would I think there is for a future meeting because at the moment the Kingman report came out just before Christmas. Yeah. That's leading to a lot of responses from the sector at the moment. So Steve Freer, who is the um, uh, the chair of the PSAA has already done a public response in public finance to some one or two recommendations that refer to PSAA's role. So there's quite a lot that, that that's in the one page actually that refers to the public sector um, in a wider context of what, what are the big four and all the others doing in response to what happened at Carillion and yeah. HS and Patisserie Valerie recently. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know whether the perhaps that's something to take outside to, to I'd love to have a session on, on where we could have that open, candid conversation about fees and about probably won't ask very long though, but it, although I've got lots of maybe something just to think about with the chair when he when he comes back, whether it would be possible to, to have that discussion. I think here, just a, just just an observation, I think. I think it's to the comment that's just been made. I think with a very strong control environment, and, you, and the council doing all the right things, um, and having appropriate due diligence, there's something about a proportionate audit service to the right standards. Yeah. What we're seeing in other parts of local government is significant levels of commercial decisions, um, significant increases in borrowing, a lot of complexity. And actually, that's raising the risk profile and the number of places for an external order. And the challenge I think we have is how on earth can we respond yeah, yeah. to all of that within the fee envelope that's been provided? So, and, and the questions I suppose come as an elected member is, and bearing in mind this is public money, is, I've got to be careful of my words, were we being charged too much previously, or, or are we being charged enough at the moment? You know, you know, what, what is the right fee for getting a really important service so that. Um, you know, because there is this adage, you pay for what you get. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think as a firm, our, our, our view, and I haven't said this publicly, but our, our view is this this level of scale fee mm. is probably reaching, you know, you're reaching the, probably the lowest place right. now. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think there is something about that. There is something. Yeah, there is something about what you know. What really happens? Good. Yeah. There's something about what happens uh, at the next round of, of procurement in, in five years' time. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That's right. Let me just make a facetious comment here. Um, be careful not to note it. <laughs> I've never had a candid conversation with either a solicitor or a council about his fees. <laughs> Okay. Anything else for we know? Thank you. There is uh, actually a mechanism, Mr. Chairman, for adjusting the fee during the course of the year. Interesting. For well, higher or well. lower? No. I'm sure it'll go down. It's <laughs> 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 All right, okay. Sorry, okay. Uh, Finally, uh, appendix B is all the things that we're required to communicate with you. Um, which will be covered in the audit results report. That will be the next key report from ourselves. <coughs> okay, that brings me to a close. Okay, okay Audrey, is there anything more to add before we just go to our next members for any final questions? No, um, I think, like you, Chair, I'm quite delighted with the narrative that's come with this report, yeah. uh, which um, I'm pleased with, and I'll look forward to working with Neil. Can I see anything further from yourselves? Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Can I, can I thank you, Neil, for coming? An impressive um, uh, presentation. Uh, and, and that uh, goes a lot for us building a relationship with you, having that trust and confidence in the work you're going to do for us, yeah. uh, and, and the public's money that is spent here in this district. And uh, yeah, most impressive. So thank you very much. And we look forward to. Um,
work with you in the future. Uh, likewise. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, okay, you've got to stay for this. We've got lots more stuff to do now. <laughs> if, you, if you need to depart, no, no, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, need to invite the committee to resolve oh, yeah. to not the report. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was a uh, I'd like to turn this committee to report. Yeah, so uh, I'd like the committee, can you please note um, the report uh, from you, Brian? Happy yeah, to do that. Really, really. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> Uh, any urgent business? No, no, thank you very much. Uh, and that comes to the conclusion of uh, tonight's uh, corporate conference meeting. So thank you very much, everyone, for turning up. Thank and you. thank you, uh, officers, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.